right, what's up, Journey fam? Good morning and happy August already. Here we are in the final days of summertime. School is getting ready to ramp back up. And over the last few months, you guys need to know that we have been absolutely blown away to see what the Lord has been doing here at this church. So welcome. Thank you guys for joining us today, especially if you're visiting, if you're just kind of checking us out. You are our honored guests today. My name is Gary Mitchell. I'm the worship leader here. And shout outs to the people who are tuning in online. As we get ready to dive into a time of worship this morning, where we sing and we make joyful noise to God, what do you say we open up with a word of prayer today? Just pause where you are, bow your head with me, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, good morning, and thank you for waking us up today. God, thank you for allowing us into your house. And Father, as we get ready to enter into worship, we pray God, that you would just take center stage now, that you would take over Holy Spirit, that you would move however you want to, and that you would turn our singing and our shouting and our time here in this place into worship that makes you smile. We pray it in Jesus' name, and everybody said together, amen. Stand to your feet and let's get to it. Go ahead and stand on up today. Put down your phone, put down your coffee, and let's get ready to lean in and engage in worship. Let's sing this from the top. Who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Let's do one more. Who shakes? Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The king of glory, the king above all kings. This is it. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, we thank God he's bringing our chaos into order today. Sing it out. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan? A son and daughter, the king of glory, the king of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the king of glory, the king above all kings. Hey, this is amazing grace, this is unfailing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid, you laid down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. We're going to declare now that no matter what's going on in your life today, no matter what might be happening in your mind or what worries that you're carrying, God is still worthy of everything we can give and so much more. Nothing can change who he is today. Sing this with us. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. And worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Join and sing. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. One more. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Whoa, you lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me.
Nothing can change the fact that God is God. Let's sing this together. Yes. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Everyone will bow down and say you are King. So let's start right now. Why would we wait? This last song, we're going to go just a little bit old school, but it's a powerful song, and it declares the truth that no matter what happens, good or bad, nothing can change the fact that God is, capital G-O-D, God, and he's big enough to handle the problems and the issues and even the secrets and the sins in our lives. Let's trust him today. You 
didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. time sing it to him. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Bow your heads. Let's go to him in prayer today. Dear Lord, your name is powerful, wonderful, and beautiful, just like you. Help us to rest in your great love, knowing we have eternal life through your son, Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for lifting up the Lord our God with us today. We invite you to, to continue to do that. You can have a seat. We've got some announcements for you today. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Journey, whether you're here in person or online. Let's give it up one more time for the worship team and the tech team. Yes, what a beautiful name it is. So my name is John Wusu. 
My wife and I are originally from Ghana in West Africa. We're blessed with two wonderful boys, and now we have our baby girl. Yay! So um, she is beautiful. She's adorable. Her name is Bella Grace, and she is almost three months. So you know how much sleep we are not getting. And so if you see us struggling through church service, just pray for us and kindly help wake us up. But no, it's great to be here at the journey. So if, you, if this is your first time, whether in person or online, or if you've been visiting with us for the last couple of times, we invite you to partake in our five-week challenge. We invite you to engage in the journey for five weeks and see if this is a place where God can use you to be a blessing and to bless you. If at the end of that time period, this might not be the best fit for you, still see the leaders, and we have collaboration with other churches in the area where we might be able to help you find a good home for you church-wise. Is it August already? What happened to the first seven months of the year? Man, time is flying. So um, t today is the day to bring in your August Angel School backpacks. You see those here. You see my prop here. So this is our annual outreach to students in the community. So please bring them in by the end of, before you go home, so that we can return them. National Night Out. So this is a wonderful, huge community outreach event happening on Thursday, August 17th in a couple of weeks at the Springfield Garden Apartments close to the Trader Joe's area. So there will be groceries, school supplies handed out. We definitely invite you to come and partake. There's going to be food, music, and games. So it'll be fun. If you are able to volunteer, we still need some volunteers. So use the church app or the QR code in front of you to sign up to volunteer for that. That would be great. Live groups is really wonderful way for engaging in the, in, in the church and everything happening around here. We are inviting those who are interested in leading or apprenticing or hosting a life group. Uh, there's going to be an info session next week at the church office during second service. The church office is that white building right across the lawn there. So please sign up through the church app. We would really love you if you have any interest in hosting or leading a life group to come to that. So we are in our sermon series Road trip. I actually have a road trip coming up right after here to Pittsburgh. So the sermon series has been really great, a blessing to all of us. And so at this point, we're going to turn it over to our lead pastor, Chad, to continue in that series. Thanks for coming again, and God bless. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Everything snuck up on me. I'm way behind here. Hold up a second. Okay, we're good. All right, first time here. That's not the norm. That usually doesn't happen, but I uh, did today. But here's the deal. When you came in, you sat down, and it says giving. You're probably like, oh, gosh, first service here, first time we've ever visited, and they're talking about giving. We're not talking about giving today. I want to talk to you briefly uh, about our giving program platform that we used um, here recently, we changed our uh, system that we're using for the church, and we're, we're using a much better system now. But uh, that means that we've got to make some adjustments, right? Some of you have downloaded the new app, the Church Center app. It's how we communicate with you about everything that's going to happen here. Uh, you can sign up for stuff. You can read about your group. Your group can stay connected. All kinds of different things you can do with that. But if you were doing recurring gifts uh, in the past or still have those set up through our old system, you're going to need to go in there and cancel that, all right? And so uh, if you pull, turn this over on the other side, it says how to cancel your push pay gift. You just take a picture of that QR code. Uh, you put in your information, your password, username, all that fun stuff. And then you can go in and cancel that. And after you cancel it, you can turn this over to the giving part. And you can hit the QR code there. And uh, it will tell you how to begin to set up re recurring gifts or gifts in general. Now, in case you're wondering, what does this look like? What is what is the website I'm going to go to look like? We got a quick little video here. We want to show you to help you understand that. Hey, Journey Church! We've set up a simple way for you to give online using Church Center Giving. If you want to give a quick gift, enter an amount, select a fund. Then, enter your email address and your first and your last name. Then enter your payment details and click Give. And that's it. We'll send a receipt to your email address that you provided. Choose a safe payment method or to manage a recurring donation. You'll want to log in. Click the Login button and we'll send a code to your phone or your email account. Verify that code and you're in. 
Now your payment info is ready to go. When you want to make a donation, to manage your giving details, switch over to the My Giving page. Here you'll see more ways that you can give. You can also add a payment method, a bank account, or a debit card. Set up a recurring donation and view your giving history. That is our giving message for the year, okay? We can move on from that. But if you have questions about this, Robin Ross, our operations director, will be outside in the lobby underneath the journey sign. Make sure you stop by there and she can answer any questions you may have. It's Saturday morning and you are heading to the beach, all right? Maybe you're going to the Outer Banks. Maybe you're going down towards Myrtle Beach. Uh, somebody told me during the first service there are actually beaches on the coast of Georgia. Uh, maybe that's where you're heading. Um, maybe you're heading down to Florida, but you're heading out to the beach. And so it's Saturday morning. You get your SUV and it is just jam-packed with beach stuff. You are ready for this trip. Now, let me stop for a second because I want to give some of you some really good advice you're going to want to listen to me on, okay? If you just move to this area, like the last couple of days, last couple of weeks, last couple of months, you need to know something. If you are going south on 95 on a weekend, you have to, don't do it, but you have to leave before 7 a.m., okay? Can I get some amens out there? All right. If you wait till 7.01, it's going to take you like three hours to get through Freddie Berg, all right? But you got to leave by 7 or before if you want any chance of getting through the worst, you know, part of the interstate in the whole wide world, okay? Anyway, that's a freebie. Take that with you. You don't have to listen to anything else. But let's say that you get in your car, you take off on this beach trip, and, uh, and you've got this beach trip. Now, I, I know some of you are like, you're kind of like travel psychos. You get in the car, and you're like, man, we got a 14-hour trip. We are not stopping until we get to our destination, right? You know people like that. I, did somebody just say amen? That might be you. I, I don't know. Um, you're weird, by the way, weird people. But, um, but you're on this trip. But here's the deal. You know at some point in time you got to stop, right? Because somebody drank a whole bottle of water right before they got in the car. You're 30 minutes in. Like, i got to stop and use the bathroom. So you're going to have to stop and use the bathroom. Or, or maybe it's lunchtime. And so you, you got to stop and grab some lunch, uh, or you got to stop and get some gas, or you need to charge your car for an hour and a half so you can go another 100 miles. I mean, <laughs> these are things that we end up doing, right? So we're on this road trip. We're driving down to the beach, and we take this stop. Doesn't it feel good to get out of the car when you're on a road trip, even though you're really excited about where you're going, and just, like, stretch your legs, you know, move your body around a little bit, walk? Take a little walk. Maybe if you got your dog, you take your walk, dog for a walk. You, you get a little bit of food. You do put a little gas in your car. You charge up your car, whatever it may be for you. But, but it kind of feels nice to just rest for a little bit before you get back on the road. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're, we're going to talk about this road trip that we are on in life, right? This the whole series is a metaphor for our life, that we are on this road trip, this long road trip, this journey. And it starts the day we are born, and it doesn't end until the day we die. But one of the things that's really, really hard for us to do is to rest on this road trip of life. I mean, think about this. You go to the beach, and you come back, and people are like, how was your beach trip? And you're like, man... I need a vacation from my vacation. Why is that the case? Because even when we take a vacation, we don't know how to stop. We don't know how to rest. And so this morning, I want to talk about the importance of rest on this road trip of life that we're on. In fact, this isn't just something new that people have been struggling with. We actually see this in Jesus' time, too. In Mark chapter 6, we read these words. It says, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. Pretty much sounds like most of our lives, right? Like this is the way we function. We are so busy. We are going so hard. We've got so much scheduled. We've got work and activities and everything else that we hardly even have time to stop and eat. But look at that last sentence. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. Jesus understood the importance 
of rest, of getting away, of taking a break, of giving yourself some space, of finding some breathing room in your life. And so when I read that, I think, well, that was pretty good for Jesus. And if that's good enough for Jesus and that was good enough for the apostles, then rest should probably be something that's good enough for us too. But why? Why is rest important? Why do we not stop to take time to rest? And what would a pattern of rest look like for us in our lives? And so that's what we're going to spend our time talking about this morning. We're going to to work to find some space, some breathing room, some ways that we can rest, and, and talk about why it's important to rest. But we're going to go back to look at parts of a story of somebody we've already looked at a couple times in this series, a guy named Moses. And if we go back to this time of Moses, we have this tribe, this group called the Israelites, right? And, uh, and when we first connect with them, with the Egyptians, they're actually connected. There, there's this relationship. There's really this, this bond, this friendship. Now, part of that is because a guy named Joseph, who is a part of the tribe of Israel, is a, a key leader within the Egyptian government. He's second in command. And so there's definitely this relationship, and the bond is pretty strong. Over time those relationships began to deteriorate. And those people that were there at that time, they're not around anymore. Well, these Egyptians look around, they're like, there's this huge group of Israelites, and they're just kind of here. Um, We've got all these projects that we want done. Let's put them to work. And so the Egyptians end up turning the Israelites into slaves. And, And they treat them about as poor as you can imagine. And so for these Israelites, they live in fear. They they live in fear of their lives and and, uh, of their health. And part of it is because when they were working, like they didn't get a break. They were working every day. And if they were sick or they were injured, you know what they would do? They would still go to work. Why would they still go to work? Well, if they didn't go to work, they didn't know if that was the day they were going to get tortured or they were going to get in trouble or they weren't going to be able to eat or they might not live to see the day to come. And so there's this fear that is there that has overcome these Israelites as they're slaves to these Egyptians. Well, God jumps in. Brings in this guy named Moses, and Moses, with God leading them, leads the Israelites out of Egypt to freedom. Leads them to this this place where they get to experience something that this generation, many generations before them, had never been able to experience before in their whole lives. And so here we, we find them on this road trip between Egypt and this promised land. And on a part of this trip... God gives them them these ten rules. We know them as the Ten Commandments. And one of those rules is all about rest. Exodus chapter 20. It says, Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. Again, put yourself in the place of these Israelites, right? They have spent hundreds of years in slavery. They don't know what rest is like. They don't know what freedom is like. And here's God who comes in and says, hey, here's the deal. One of my ten rules for you is that you take time to rest. And do you think they were like, wow, this is great, this is wonderful. They're like, well, hold up a second. If, if If we don't work... Then, then we don't eat. And if we don't work, we might starve. And if we don't work, we might be tortured. If we don't work, we might die. And so their minds are going back to hundreds of years of experiences that they've had. And here is God who's saying, no, rest. And God says, here's 24 hours. I want you to rest. And I want you to trust that I will take care of you. Rest in me, rest with me, trust me, have faith in me, and I'll take care of your needs. Which then brings us back to us today and the culture that we live in. Because for us, we don't know how to rest. And so when we begin to look at our lives and everything that we are experiencing in our life, so much of the tensions and struggles and issues and problems that you and I have comes because we don't rest. I mean, think about it physically, what happens when we don't rest. Hypertension, right? 
high blood pressure. What they're finding now is that younger generations are struggling more with high blood pressure than ever before. Why could that be the case? Stress levels are so high. Why are stress levels so high? It's because we don't know how to stop and rest. When we don't rest, we're fatigued, which makes sense. Oh, by the way, when we don't rest, insomnia kicks in, which doesn't make sense. Like I'm so tired because I've been going so hard, but I can't sleep because my body just hasn't learned how to just shut itself down. Or, or maybe for some of us, intimacy has gone, right? Our sex drive is gone. Why? Because physically we are just so tired because we don't know how to rest. And so there's this physical state of who we are that is impacted by not taking the time to rest. There's our mental state. Could be that some of us deal with anxiety and depression because we don't take time to rest. Maybe we lack motivation or we lack focus because we haven't taken time to rest. Maybe we're an irritable person, we're an angry person because we haven't just stopped to rest. And oh, by the way, our relationships suffer too, right? We say, hey, this person is important to me, this people, these people are important to me, my friends and my family, I love them, I care for them. But we don't rest, and so those relationships suffer. We're not investing any time in those relationships. We're investing in our workload. We're investing in activities and all these other things, and we're not investing in our relationships because we don't rest to give us time to invest in them. And not to mention our spiritual state. When we don't rest, we're not making time to connect with God. And my guess is, for many of us, these are things that we struggle with because we don't rest. But, you know, I've never heard anyone say this, and probably the same for you. I've never heard anybody say, I would really love to have more stress in my life. <laughs> never heard that. Or, you know what, I would really love to have more health issues related to my calendar being so full. No one says that. Or no one says, hey, I really would love to have more of my relationships suffer because because I don't know how to rest. No one says that. Why? Because that's not the life that we want to live. And yet for so many people, that is exactly the life we live every single day. But why don't we change? Like we know this, we experience this, we know the importance of it, and yet we won't change. What is it that keeps us from changing? Well, it goes back to those Israelites. It's fear. That we have these fears in our life that keep us from living a life that has rest in it. So we don't experience these things that we just talked about. Now, what are some of those fears? One fear is FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. We fear that we will miss out on something if we say no, right? You get an invitation to go to this one particular social event. And you think, well, if I say no to that, then the person in my dreams was going to be there and I'm going to miss it. And so I'm just always going to say yes. And so you always say yes. So your calendar is full. Or, or your work world comes in like, hey, for the next year, we're going to need you to work seven days a week and give us all your time and all your effort. And instead of saying no or, hey, we need to talk about this, we're like, yes, I'll do this. Why? Because we're afraid we're not going to get that promotion or someone else is going to get it because they did it and we didn't. Or, or it could be that when it comes to our work world that another business trip comes up and they keep asking you because you keep saying yes and other people are saying no because they maybe they're a little bit healthier than you are but you keep saying yes because you want that next job you want that pay increase and so we keep saying yes to things in our life because we have this fear we're going to miss out on something and that fear drives us to live these lives where we don't rest so it's in our work world, it's in our social world, and oh, by the way, parents, this is something that's really, really hard for us to deal with too. Because here's what we'll do. We'll have our kids in 10 different activities, and our kid will say, hey, I want to do this other thing. And instead of saying no, we're like, sure. Or instead of saying no, or this just kind of slow down a little bit, we're like, no, we really need to get you into this next activity because, hey, I know you're two years old, but you never know when a scout's going to be looking at you and ready to bring you to their college or make you a pro, right? Parents, we are jacked up when it comes to those ideas. And so we will say yes all the time. And we'll never rest because we're fear, we fear that our kids are going to miss out on something. Now, my guess is more that we fear we're going to miss out on something with our kids there. But, 
But this fear just drives us to live these crazy lives, and we never find time to rest. And so for some of us, it's fear of missing out. For others of us, it's the fear of falling behind. Uh, This is where we compare our standard of living in relationship to our peers. Like we look where we are in life, and then we look at our peers, and we look at the cars they drive, we look at the clothes they wear, the vacations they take, the homes they live in, and then we start to compare ourselves to them. And if we're not at the same level as them, or we haven't surpassed them, then there's this fear that we have fallen behind, and somehow we got to catch up with, with our peers. Back in 1913, I mean, this isn't something new. There's a guy named Arthur Momand, and he um, came up with a comic strip about this upwardly mobile family, and it was about them trying to keep up with their neighbors. The names of the neighbors were the Joneses. This, this phrase, keeping up with the Joneses, actually comes from this comic strip. And why is this so important? Because even back in 1913, people were struggling with this. And, and here we are today, 100 years later, and we still are struggling with this. We're co- trying to keep up with the Joneses. And so this is, since this is the fear that we have, what do we do? We work harder. We work longer hours. We add more stuff to our calendar. We spend more money just so we don't fall behind. And so for some of us, we struggle with this fear of falling behind. And then for others, it may be the fear of, of mattering. I can honestly tell you that those first two fears aren't real struggles for me. The fear of mattering is one that I have struggled with my whole life, especially in my 25 years in, in ministry. I, I, I want my life to count for something. I, I want people to notice the work that I, I do. And so for 25 years almost, I have struggled with, with getting to this point of, of making sure people notice. Now, here's the funny part. I don't need you to notice the work that I'm doing. That, that's not the, the, the group that I, I want to hear that from. It's my peers in ministry. It, it's other pastor friends who have the exact same job that I do. I want to be able to get together with them and say, hey, let me tell you about all these amazing things happening at my church. Let me tell you about how many people are coming, how the giving's going, how many people are helping in the community, how many people are baptizing. And here's what I've realized, and, and I'm at a way better place, just in case you're wondering, way better place. Counseling has been a part of that and helped me kind of definitely work through this. I have a couple of pastoral cohorts that I'm a part of, and, and, and these guys have really invested in me as I've done in their lives, and we're all kind of getting beyond this. But, um, but, but one of the things that, that I, I realize is that so often before, I was saying, look at, what, look at what I'm doing. And over the past few years, I began to realize I'm saying the wrong thing. It's really, look at what God has been doing and look at what I get to be a part of. Because there's this fear deep down with the work that I do, like, does it matter? Do people notice? Do my friends and peers notice? And maybe it's the same for you. Maybe you struggle with the same thing. Maybe you struggle with wondering, do I matter? Do people notice my work? On the day that I I, I quit this job or I retire or I move on to somewhere else, is there going to be like weeping and gnashing of teeth in in the office and be like, Oh, we're going to miss you. People are crying in the streets because you're gone. I mean, we kind of want that, don't we, deep down? But, of course, that's not healthy because we have this fear that maybe we don't matter. One of these fears may fit you. And maybe it doesn't. Maybe there's another fear that, that you have. But no matter what that fear may be, there's actually something much bigger at play here. There's a larger issue. Because for you and for me, if fear keeps you from resting, if it keeps me from resting, you know what we have? We have a faith issue. And the question is, do I trust God in my life? And that's the same question for you. Do you trust God in your life? I want to go back to that commandment again that God gave the Israelites because 
we focused on one piece to that, and there's something that's so much more important in here that we miss. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of what? Rest dedicated to the Lord your God. So here's what God said. God said, here's the deal. I want you to work six days. And then God's like, on that seventh day for 24 hours, I know you, I want you to work hard those six days. That seventh day, here's what I want you to do. I want you to shove as many activities and events and social things in your calendar as you can into that one day so that the next day when you go to work, you're just worn out, you're tired, you don't want to be there, right? And that's not what, what God says here. God says, I want you to take six days, work really hard, put your time and effort into it, but on this last day, I want you to spend time to breathe, to find some space, to rest. And, and not just rest in this, I want you to connect with me. We hear that in the culture we live in today, and we think to ourselves, man, that's some ways that sounds great, but I don't know how to do 24 hours off, right? You know, I work Monday through Friday, and I put a lot of time into that. And Saturdays come, and, you know, we're really busy with whatever's going on in our life. And then Sunday's here, and it's like, oh, I got it. Sunday mornings, that's when I'll rest, right? I'll take off. I'm not going to do church. I'm not going to do anything like that. I'm just going to rest. I got it figured out. I think you're kind of missing the point right here, Okay. There's something else that God is saying. God is saying rest, but rest in me. And, and yet we don't know how to rest. So how can we do that? Is there a way that we can find this rest in our life that does fit this culture that we live in and is still true to this commandment that God gives? Well, let me give you some uh, ideas of what you can do. And what I'm getting ready to tell you is super practical, okay? So if you're like a super practical person, get out your pen and paper because that's probably how you take notes. Or get out your phone. I want you to write these down. If you're like looking for something deep and theological with big church words, I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's not going to happen, okay? But I do want to say this. What we're going to talk about is a theology of rest. And it's so important that we understand this and we live this out, especially if we call ourselves followers of Christ, okay? So here we go. Here's the very first thing. Divert daily. Divert daily. Every single day, take time to rest and to connect with God. Now, when we think about this, we usually think about the traditional way, right? The traditional way is, you know, I, I get my Bible and, you know, I go, go to my really nice table that I've handcrafted myself in my wood shop and I sit down at it and I've got my Bible, I've got my journal, you know, I've got a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, I've got a, you know, a, a cup of whiskey, whatever it may be for you, it kind of helps you. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And I'm going to sit down, I'm going to read scripture, and I'm going to journal while I'm doing this, and then I'm going to spend time in prayer. It's kind of the traditional way to do that. Now, granted, it's kind of the way that I do it, this, what fits best for me and the kind of way I, I think through things. And, and maybe that's you, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. Keep doing that, okay? But there's another group that's like, look, man, I don't have any woodworking skills, so I'm just going to have to sit at my table um, that I bought at Ikea, and I don't really like to read. I mean, what am I, I mean, because I don't like to read and I don't like to write and journal stuff, I guess I just don't spend time with God. No. Thank you. Um, <laughs> here's how you do it. Here's an example. Let's say you're an outdoorsy person, okay? You, you want to know how you connect with God? You go out for a walk. Or you go for a run, or you go for a hike, or you get on your bike and you take off. And, and the traditionalists are like, no, 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 you can't do that because you got to read the Bible. And how are you going to read the Bible when you're riding your bike, right? You can't do that. What's going to happen? You're going to crash your bike. Thank God, and I mean this literally, for technology. Because because of technology, we don't have to worry about this anymore, okay? There is an app called the Bible app. And you can go to your Google Play, your Apple App Store, whichever you use, and you can download it. And you can go to whatever you want to read or, or, or listen to because it has a play button down at the bottom. You find the book, you find the chapter, you hit play. Apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. 
Can you hear that? It's not great. It's not James Earl Jones' voice, I know. But the guy's not too bad, and they put a little music behind it sometimes. It gives a little mood for you. But, man, you, you pop in your AirPods or whatever it is you use, your bows or beats or whatever, and you just, you just go and you spend time listening to the Scripture. And, again, traditional is like, oh, you got to read it. Hey, I don't think God cares how you soak in the Bible. Just that you're doing it and you're spending time doing it. And so you do this, you listen, and then you do that for a little while, and then you turn it off, and then you spend time praying. It's a great way for us to connect. Now, maybe you don't connect either one of those ways. Maybe there's something else that you do. Find out how to do that and divert daily. You get to choose whenever you want to do it. You can choose wherever you want to do it, but divert daily where you're stopping to breathe and rest and connect with God. Okay? First step. Second thing you can do, withdraw weekly. We got to learn how to stop working. We got to learn to unplug from our phones and email and text messages. We got to learn to unplug from the busyness of life. And so here's a calendar thing that you do. On your calendar every week, you find like a two hour period that you block off just for you. All right? You got kids, you're like, I don't know how to do this. Yeah, you do. You give them a bunch of food, you set them in front of the TV. You go out on the patio, you go to the kitchen table, whatever it may be, let them watch whatever. And then for, for two hours, you just sit and you breathe for a little bit and you rest and you spend some of that time connecting with God. For me, that's Fridays. Uh, Fridays is my day off. It's Care day, Care's day off, too. So we spend a lot of Fridays together. And, um, and part of that is just finding some time just for us to get away as a couple. And some of that is just finding time to do things uh, around the house where we're just kind of we're just kind of resting. Um, and so if you text me on a Friday, I'm not going to answer it. If you call me, which nobody calls anymore, but if you do, I'm probably not going to answer it. Um, if you send an email on the good Fridays that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I won't look at my email. On bad Fridays, like this past Friday, I look at my email the whole time. I didn't hold true to this this past week. But if you ask for a meeting on a Friday and I say no, it's not that I don't love you and care about you. I'm just trying to hold true to this withdrawal weekly. Because it's so important that we find time each week. And maybe you can do a day. Maybe it's just a few hours. But we have to learn to withdraw weekly. And in that, we rest. And at some point in time, we spend a little bit of it connecting with God. But that's each week. Here's something else. Quit quarterly. Now, I am trying to do this, and I am having a hard time figuring this one out, and this is part of my fall planning. Uh, this one definitely takes a little time to plan out. This is where you take a half a day, and, um, and you just get away, all right? You, you set up your own little personal retreat, your, your own little spiritual retreat, but you find a, a half a day, and, and by the way, if you're a stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home dad, and you're like, I don't know what to do with the kids, you know what you do? You hire a babysitter. Because this is going to be the best money you're going to invest each quarter. Is that you invest in that babysitter. It might hurt the pocketbook a little bit. But what it will do for you on a personal level and on a spiritual level will be huge. So you put this on the calendar. You set up that day. And on the calendar you put where you're going, what you're going to do, where you're going to be, how long you're going to be there. And then you get away for that personal retreat. You, you go and you sit and you, you maybe you, you think about the, the past few months or the past year and you kind of think through that. Maybe you pray through that a little bit, right? Or maybe you've kept a prayer journal. You go back and you look at that prayer journal like, hey, this is where I see God's been at work. Or, and then you think about the, the future. What does the future look like? What are kind of my God-sized dreams that are out there? What does God have for me? And what does God have for me in this relationship? What does God have for me and my family and, and, and me and my work? And so you just spend some time praying, but you just stop. And rest and quit and unplug and you listen and connect to the God. And so quit quarterly. And then the last thing I would say is abandon annually. Maybe you've seen this uh, tweet before. This is from Samuel Pollan. European out of offices. I'm away camping for the summer. Email me again in September. 
American out of offices. I have left the office for two hours to undergo kidney surgery, but you can reach me on my cell anytime. <laughs> Sound right, doesn't it? I mean, I don't know. Uh, most people I talk to from Europe or been to Europe are like, Dude, for like four weeks, they're gone. Like, you don't know where they are. You can't track them down. You can't talk to anybody. Like, they literally get away from work. And for us in America, we don't know how to do that. Even if we go in for surgery, like, hey, man, I'm going to be out in two hours. I'll be good. You know, you call me as soon as I'm done. We can make this deal happen. We don't know how to rest, especially when it comes to something like vacations. Like I said earlier, we go on vacations and we come back from vacations and we want to take a vacation because we were busy the whole time we were gone. If you've got vacation days, you got to use them. They're there for a reason. They want you to rest. Even though they act like they don't, they want you to rest because they know if you're rested, you're probably going to be better for the business, for the company. Take your vacation days. And I say this to you as someone who in seven years hasn't taken all their vacation days here at The Journey. And there's this one part of me deep down that's like, hey, that's a badge of honor, right? I just kept working. I'm better than you because I didn't spend all my vacation days. Here's what I've realized in the last couple of years. That is stupid. And honestly, I'm sinning against you, against my family, against myself, and against God. And so I've told our leadership about two months ago, we were meeting, I said, you have got to make sure I am taking all of my vacation days. Because you want me to stick around, I think. You want me to be sane. You want my family to, to be healthy. I've got to take vacation. Hey, guess what? You have got to take your vacation days too. Which means when you get away, unplug. That stupid email app you have on your phone, delete it for the week. Don't answer text messages. Put your phone up somewhere so you don't see it because it's a temptation to go and grab it and see what's happening and what's going on. I, I, maybe there's a couple of you that you are really super important and they got to kind of keep in touch with you. But it's like I tell my kids, I don't think you're that important. I think you can put your phone down for a little bit. That's what I tell myself now. But put it away. Get away from it. Get away from everything else that's happening in life. And rest while you're away to do what? To rest. I told you guys earlier on in the series that we took our first vacation, our only vacation for the year at this time. Um, back at the end of June, we went down to the Outer Banks. We had an amazing time. And it is the first time in 25 years of, of ministry that I totally shut everything off. Kara and I both, we got rid of our, um, our email apps, and we didn't check email the whole week. And I, I don't remember getting any text messages. We tell staff when staff is gone, like, hey, we're not going to email you, or we're specifically, we're not going to call you, and we're not going to text you. So we take staff off of email or text threads. They did that to me and Kara. They took us off the text thread, so we didn't know what was happening here. And you know what? It was glorious. Because we came back, and it's the first time in 25 years that I know I did not do work while I was on vacation. And I came back so refreshed and ready to go back to work. I could have used a few more days, I'm not going to lie, but ready to come back to work. And in that time I was away, I didn't spend every waking hour connecting with God, but periodically throughout the week, you know what I did? I just stopped. I went out on the patio, I looked at the ocean, and I just, I just rested and connected with God. And spiritually, man, that's exactly what my soul needed. And I bet that's what many of us here need to. To spend time abandoning annually, to get away. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to go to some exotic island somewhere or to the beach. Look, you can do a staycation and do the exact same thing. But it's important that we stop and we rest, and in that we connect with God. If we go back to Jesus again, Jesus was great at this. Jesus understood the importance of rest. And if we go in the New Testament, we can see story after story where we find that Jesus has been working really hard, and then at the end of the day or early in the morning, he goes off by himself, and what does he do? He rests. And every single time, 
He spends time with God. And like I said earlier, if it's good enough for Jesus, it should be good enough for you and for me. And yet I fear this is the one thing that is missing in our lives. The question is, do you trust God? Do you have faith in God? Do I trust God? Do I have faith in God? Because if we do, we will find time to rest. That's why I love this moment of communion that we do together every single Sunday. I mean, it's really the beauty behind it if we think about it. If we go back to the Israelites, in fact, and we think about what they experienced, um, something that they put into practice was this thing called Passover. And Passover was a reminder to them that they had been saved from slavery, that they had this freedom, that now they could put their faith and trust in God. They could rest with God. And the reason was pretty simple because God had, had led them to this new place. God had led them to freedom. And it's the same thing for you and me, that every single week when we take communion together, it is our Passover. It is our moment where we are reminded that we have been pulled out of slavery too. That we're free. We're we're free from our past. We're free from our messiness, our sin. We are free because of Jesus Christ in our life. And in that, that means we should have our faith and we should put our trust in God, which means we should take time to rest with God. And so right now, as we take this together, as we take this piece of bread together, the question for us to think through as we eat it, Is my faith and my trust in God. Let's eat together. And as we drink together this morning, my question to you is, will you find your rest that you and I all need in our life with God and in God? moving forward because again we are freed we're freed from our time we're freed from our schedules we're freed from our sins and let's rest in god let's drink together god thank you so much for the reminder of rest and moving forward god may we become more a people of rest than we ever have been. And in that rest, show you of the faith and the trust that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What do you say we finish up our time today by just declaring that come what may, we're going to rest in the sovereignty and in the grace of God. Stand on up to your feet today. If he's been good to you, lift your voice and let's sing this together. Yes, I will. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yeah. Let's go from the top. This is what we're counting on right here. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. He won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Come on and sing.
Amen. God is good and all the time. Right on. Thanks for being here today. If you are new and you'd like to connect with us, head to the tent outside. If you are in need of prayer, we've got a member of our prayer team right over here. And hey, listen, just because it's summertime and we love summer snacks, we have free ice cream and popsicles for you guys outside. Yes, really. Go outside, get you some sugar, and we will see you right back here next week. Stay cool. Stay blessed. Stay in touch.